Over to you. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Jonathan, for the presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today's panel discussion. We are honored to have Maureen from Standard Chartered Bank, Serena from Transport Capital, Madeline from Wilson Valley Williams, and James from Citibank. So first of all, I would invite each of our guests to give a brief introduction about themselves and their organizations. So Maureen, can we start from you? Yeah, thank you, Simone. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maureen. Uh, I'm from Standard Charter Bank. Um, I joined the bank 10 years ago, uh, two years as a trainee and eight years in shipping finance team. Uh, I'm currently covering all the Chinese clients. Um, in our bank, the shipping finance team has a team of 20 transactors globally and looking after a portfolio of around US dollar 5 billion. Um, and the Standard Chartered Bank is also one of the top three foreign banks in China. And we have established very good relationship with all the major clients in China. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Um, Serena, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Serena, sorry, I'm afraid I cannot hear you. Sorry. Uh, hi. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to uh, join this panel on behalf of uh, Transport Capital. Um, as uh, many of you know, and, uh, I worked for mentioned financial leasing for the past five years and joined uh, Transport Capital from this year. And the Transfer Capital is a seven-year-old investment management and advisory company focused on the global transport industry, including shipping, aviation, and offshore. Our three key services are number one, investment management. We manage vessels for institutional investors and provide asset warehousing solutions for NPL. Number two, uh, financial advisory. We, we provide a total solution on senior junior debt sourcing, equity raising, M&A, and uh, uh, financial restructuring to our clients. Number three, we are the exclusive lending agent to DECA Bank in Asia, Greece, and North America. And uh, we have a subsidiary, Seahawk, which focuses on financial assets investment. And uh, we also have a GV named TCT, which is an uh, in house SMP and a chartering broker based in Singapore. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, Simone. Um, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Madeline Liu. I'm the partner of the Hong Kong office of Watson Valley Williams. I've been involved for over 20 years in maritime financing. I'm the head of the Hong Kong office and I lead a team of 20 fianos who are dedicated to ship finance. And we cover not just banking, but also leasing on the finance and operating type of leases as well as tax leases and project finance. And we do due diligence of the underlying projects as well as we do some simple sale and purchases as well. Globally, we have 15 offices around the world, all handling also ship finance. And I'm very pleased to be part of this panel. Thank you. And now, Link, um, James, can you please introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Tong. I run the regional shipping business for City. Um, globally, we have about 40 shipping bankers and also four dedicated risk managers around the globe. In China, we are also one of the biggest foreign bank investment in, in China. And I was fortunate enough to be able to work in China two years in 18 and 19 in Shanghai and look after seven industry. From that experience, I really learned a lot, particularly how much, how fast China has grown and also how shipping is the integral part for all the industries. I have been banking for 25 years and shipping with City for almost 18 years. And I look forward to have a good session with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Well, uh, let me introduce briefly about Stevenson Howard. Uh, Stevenson Howard is uh, a full service law firm uh, with uh, 11 international offices. Uh, Shipping Finance Fridays is always one of the core business of the firm. Uh, and we have advised clients, including uh, banks, leading companies, earners, and shipyards uh, for various transactions. Uh, we meet friends in shipping and finance. Uh, industries and also witness changes in the past decades. 
Uh, I was a partner of the firm and now a consultant. Simone uh, is now leading the team in Shanghai office. Uh, Simone, she has very good experience in shipping and also working in very office of the firm. I now uh, pass on to Simone to moderate the panel. Thank you, Vincent. So this session, we will focus on the cooperation of international banks and Chinese banks and leasing companies and catering for the shipping demand for capital in China. I know all of our guests today have extensive experience in the Chinese shipping capital market. We also believe that in the past 10 years, you all have witnessed the emergence of Chinese banks and leasing companies in the shipping market. So from your perspective, what is the main difference or the most interesting one between Chinese financial institutions and international banks? Uh, can I invite Maureen to give us your view, please? Yeah, sure, Simon. Um, so I think um, the definition of Chinese financial institutions, probably we have two types. The first is the traditional Chinese banks, and the second type or type B is the Chinese leasing companies who has grown very fast um, in the past few years. I think in terms of traditional Chinese banks, uh, I think their major difference compared to international banks is that um, a lot of the time they are more policy driven. Um, they have a lot of internal um, themes or topics that they need to follow. So sometimes when, when you check with them for a transaction, um, they will need to check their internal latest or recent policy first to see whether they can support. And if they can support, they usually have a very big uh, appetite. So that's very different uh, from international banks. Um, international banks, um, our policy is more consistent, I would say. So there's no um, changing topics or, or, or um, too frequent changes of policies compared to Chinese banks. There's no good or bad, um, I would say. It's just that different um, different institutions act in different style. And then in terms of Chinese leasing companies, I think their the major difference compared to international banks is their flexibility. Um, they can provide relatively high leverage, relatively longer tenure, um, and also sometimes they can accept very old vessels, the vintage vessels, as long as they're confident that they can, um, they can take a view on the metal risk. So I think that's the, the major difference. Thanks. Um, James, do you have any opinion from your experience? Um, I think it's really good to have more Chinese financial institutions to be involved in the shipping finance. Similarly, we have seen quite a lot of European banks have retrieved the market. And also, shipbuilding industry itself is one of the largest in China. And I do think that having more Chinese banks to be participating or actually just to work with international bank will allow both sides to really get familiar with each other. And so that at the end of the day, as a bankers, we want to deliver a solution to clients. So any part of those banks cannot really deliver would also affect our clients. So I think the more cooperation that we have, the more familiar we become and the, the more confidence that we'll be able to create it for our shipping clients. Thank you. And Serena? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, like what just uh, Marine said, there are two categories of Chinese uh, financial institutions. And uh, what I want to say today is about the Chinese financial store. I think most of the Chinese financial stores started their shipping business like a bank. Although their shipping finance history is much shorter, but they are fast learners. They became more and more professional in this industry. Their professional is not referred to the um, uh, market forecast or market analysis. They are becoming professional in terms of how to mitigate risks and deal with distressed assets. In addition to financial lease, we can see more and more written lease transactions with Chinese law source. In this, re in this regard, I think Chinese law source is a competitor of some 20 providers. As a financial institution, no one can avoid risk. So what are the tools they can use to deal with distressed assets is quite important. Financial resources usually have more tools than traditional banks. In addition to restructuring and auction, more and more Chinese resources have the capacity to withdraw the vessels and operate them to get cash flow. In this regard, I think Chinese resources is definitely not a competitor of banks. They are very good clients to shipping banks. 
And on the other hand, the Chinese law source can get attractive long-term financing uh, from shipping banks to support their fast-growing portfolio. So this is a perfect uh, cooperation. Thanks, Serena. And um, now, do you want to share with us any of your view? Yeah, I think that, um, well, in terms of differences, I think that the um, international banks are probably a little bit ahead in terms of things like Poseidon principles and environmental issues. Um, as you know, if you look at the Poseidon principle signatories, you have people, uh, banks like Citibank, ABN, SOCGEN, uh, CASIV, uh, BNPP, SUMI Trust, etc. But I do know that the Chinese banks are becoming more and more aware of the need to become more green. They're more aware of sanctions. They're more aware of environmental issues. So I think increasingly they will um, also probably be a signatory to the Poseidon principles. Um, so that is one difference between themselves and the um, Western banks. Um, however, in terms of whether they are competing with the Chinese banks, are competing with the Western banks or not, I think there is collaboration. There's also competition. Um, the collaboration, you can see it very clearly whenever you have a Sinosure, an ECA facility, more often than not, um, the, the Western banks would prefer to work with the Chinese banks um, as a Sinosure agent because they are able to facilitate and communicate better with Sinosure, they understand the culture, there's a little bit more efficiency. Um, that's not to say that sometimes within the Western banks themselves, they do have a team uh, who, uh, who are local and can actually also do that task. But for those who don't have that team available, it's a very good way to facilitate and to deal with Sinosure. Um, there is also slight competition, I guess, because in, in today's market, there there is um, there isn't that many very um, lucrative or, or perhaps uh, financial um, borrowers of financial standing which which banks would like to deal with so there is a slight competition there there is of course um, a tendency maybe to uh, prefer some of the Chinese leasing deals because their lessee counterparties are can be very um, can be of good standing combined with the fact that you have a good lessor behind it makes it even more attractive. Yeah, as Madeline just mentioned about, we all see the collaboration and cooperation between the Chinese banks and Western banks. So from uh, James and Maureen, from Western bankers' perspective, how would you describe the existing relationship between Chinese banks and international banks? And what would you expect from the Chinese counterparties? What would you contribute to build up the finance project together? Can we hear from James first? Well, I think as, as Madeline rightly pointed out, because we are the signatory cities, one of the signatories for the Poseidon principle. So we are bound to those rules that not just only Poseidon principle, in fact, the whole city group itself. And you will notice that we have announced that the 2014 to 2019, we actually allocated about $100 billion to invest in green, green industries. And we actually achieved more than $160 billion. And now we come up, our CEO also mentioned that we're going to provide another $350 billion to concentrate on that. I think this is the part that where I think the financial lessor in China will play a very important role, given that they will have as Serena mentioned, that they will have much better balance sheets and they have they are able to leverage up and also shipping is only part of their portfolio and they'll be able to source different funding to support these new ships, green technology. And given shipyards are large, there are lots of uh, well, ship, shipping industries, one pillar industry in China, I think having them to work with the financial institution who will be able to drive the value of environmental friendly green ships and that would really allow the sustainability of the whole shipping industry itself uh, because otherwise 
it will be pretty much like any other industry will have over capacity. I think it's really good that 10 years ago, financial crisis, that actually stopped it, a lot of speculation tonnage in there. And that's why nowadays, even at COVID-19, shipping has become enjoying the, 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 the winter profit of that. It has been a boon for, for different types of shipping companies. I just think that for that part, if we are able to work with financial leasing companies, we have financial strength and to steer the industry towards to a greener ships, then a lot of ship owners will be able to start preparing green ships because by 2030, you will be reduction in the uh, 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 carbon emission. So that means in a few years time, we need to start investing in those ships so that it will be coming to the market. And we know that majority of the ships, commercial ships are not yet truly green ships. We might see that LNG, we might see that in the past scub, 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 scubbers, et cetera. And then lots of new ships are putting in dual fuels or even trio fuel because no one really have a green energy yet, right? We're talking about hydrogen too. So how are we going to find the sustainability? It really takes a lot of capital investment, R&D, and I don't think shipping company will have the means to do so, particularly this technology might be gone in five years time. So I think it is a really good time to really work with each other to towards, towards a greener environment. Then I think all those ship owners will be able to benefit that. And also for us, we'll be able to grow with Gohans in the next era. Thanks, James. And Maureen, from your experience, do you think yeah. what the relationship yeah, um, I agree with James that green will be um, a trend, uh, will be the new trend. Um, and apart from that, I think what I would expect from uh, especially the Chinese leasing companies is that they can also gradually build up their operation, um, I mean, technical operation of the of the of the ships, and also to build up their um, capability um, of of taking possession of the vessels. The reason why I mentioned this is like two or three years ago when when I am discussing with Chinese leasing companies about financing them. Most of the time I will hear comment from them that Maureen, you don't need to look at the charters, you just need to look at us. We are a bank owned the leasing companies. But to be honest, international banks don't look at it at that way um, because the Chinese leasing companies, they are still a financial institution. So um, in, in case anything happens, they don't have the capacity to take back the vessel and then operate. But actually, in the in the past two to three years, I think after after many years of education and communication, leasing companies also understand this. And nowadays, I I rarely uh, hear any of these comments anymore from the leasing companies. And also at the main, uh, at the same time, I can see that some Chinese banks or uh, Chinese leasing companies are already taking pioneer actions to um, build up a small team of technical operation. Um, for, for their own team and just in case uh, if anything happens they can take back the vessel and operate. I think that will also be a new trend. I hope that um, in the next two to three years um, I can confidently tell our internal credit that yes the leasing companies they are not just a financial institution. They have the real um, ship owning and ship operating capacity so we can take more risk um, or ship more risk weighting uh, on those leasing companies. So that's, I think, will also be another uh, trend in terms of working with Chinese leasing companies. Yeah. Thanks, Maureen. And um, Serena, I know you just left a Chinese leasing company and joined Transport Capital a year ago. So from this change of position, I think you have more to share about this topic. Um, thank you, Simone. <clears throat> Actually, not one year, <clears throat> one year ago, just uh, uh, half a year. <clears throat> I think financial institution and uh, a broker house are very different in many aspects. I'm not the only one who come from financial institutions. I have colleagues in transfer capital came from Standard Charter, Node LB, uh, HSH North, and DBS as well. And uh, I think each financial institution has its own products with some limitations and uh, different appetites. As an experienced broker house, we are good at providing bespoke solutions based on the global extensive financing channels. 
um, and professional knowledge of different kinds of shipping finance. Uh, Transfer Capital is an international company with headquarters in Singapore and the regional offices in Hamburg, Athens, Beijing, New York, and Seoul. I think we are very relevant to today's topic because our daily work is to search cooperation and uh, opportunities, um, especially as a lending agent of DECA Bank. Our mandate is to originate and structure senior debt financing for DECA Bank on bilateral collab or syndicated basis. DECA Bank's total assets is around uh, 310 billion euros, although its shipping portfolio is not ranked by the front among its peers. Uh, but the book quality is super good. Uh, so the current uh, the pandemic situation didn't cause any issues and thus they remain interested in doing business going forward. They keep on being uh, focused on low risk projects. In recent years, Deca Bank has done many financing deals with top Chinese uh, leasing companies, but they will not just uh, rely on the credit of Lasor, uh, like just uh, Marie mentioned. The underlying projects or assets must work for its internal criteria. The added value for Chinese source remains to be DACA's competitive funding terms. I think its competitive funding pricing mainly is benefited from the good international ratings and the strong shareholder support, but also related to its cost control strategy. DACA Bank has no many overseas branches. So, uh, Transport Capital is an exclusive agent to DACA in Asia, Greece, and North America. We work as a marketing department inside the bank. It's a time and cost efficient model in my mind. And another point I'd like to mention is that DACA Bank prefers to cooperate with the experienced shipping banks, either for primary lending or secondary loan distribution. Um, going forward, we will support the onboarding of more top-tier clients for DECA and expanding more cooperation with Chinese banks and the ECA. Uh, in one word, I can see more cooperation than com competition in the shipping finance industry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we just heard the bank's view. Um, Natalie, from a lawyer's perspective, can you share with us your point of view? Um, yeah, I, I think um, the only thing I was going to really say is that um, in terms of uh, understanding, I think the Chinese banks have, and just picking up on what Maureen was saying earlier in terms of financing a leasing transaction, I feel that sometimes the Chinese banks have a better understanding of the fact that if a bank is looking for credit support from the lessor um, and that the lessor is unable to provide a guarantee from the holding company or the parent bank because of safe approvals or safe registrations, then in lieu of that, um, they have been offering and providing remarketing agreements, which these sort of structures are prevalent in the aviation market. Um, and now being adopted in the maritime market, but they've been providing um, the remarketing agreements or option agreements or sometimes standby bare boat charters. Um, the question that we always get asked by international banks as lawyers is, are, are these um, instruments uh, enforceable? And are they as good as a guarantee? And that's the question we're always asked. And um, if they are properly uh, drafted, they, they will do the job. They are not the same as a guarantee, but they can ensure that the bank will be paid. Um, as to whether they are enforceable in accordance with its terms, the, the answer under English law is yes, because even, in the, even if they are construed as guarantees by a Chinese legal counsel, and even if there is a need for safe registration or approval and there's a lack of safe registration or approval, that doesn't affect its enforceability or validity. All it means is that US dollars can't be remitted out of China without the safe registration, but the validity is still there. Um, so I think with the Chinese banks, they do understand that they are comfortable with it. Um, 
and Western banks are becoming more familiar and more comfortable with it. Um, but in, in the initial stages, there are a lot of questions and queries about it. Thank you. Um, as James mentioned about the uh, the financial crisis, the COVID-19 situation, we always say that the shipping industry is ever-changing and affected by things like the environmental protection policies, the COVID-19 pandemic, and economic crisis, etc. So what is the bank's view as to the future development of shipping industry and what will be the role of the financial institutions? Um, Maureen, do you have can you share with you? Yeah, um, I think I think uh, going environmental, um, env environmentally friendly, and also going green um, will be the, the major uh, theme, as James has mentioned. So I think um, a lot of changes uh, are happening uh, in the world, and a lot of changes can actually be driven by capital. So um, as responsible um, banks and responsible financial institutions, I think that's where um, we can all make a contribution. Um, I think when I talk to um, the younger generation, because right now we have interns that's from the that's that uh, that were born in in 2000. So actually, they they are quite um, quite focused on on going green and going environmentally friendly. I, I think that's definitely the the new trend, and and that's also what we should um, all work together to to contribute. Simon, over to you. Okay. So, um, thank you, Maureen. And um, James, can you also please share with your point of view? Well, I think shipping will continue to be very important. And as you can see that even COVID-19 at that time, there are lots of social distancing or even block lockdown. Shipping continue to be able to move necessities and goods. And most important of all, the digital world, the e-commerce that allow people not to go out and you can still shop. So I think there is a definitely a change and shift in the way that how we purchase. And I do agree that those will be driven by the young people too, because what their expectations are gonna be, what do they demand from the world? I bet most of the kids that now in school, the first thing they learn about recycling, they will talk about uh, obviously COVID-19, mm -hmm them to as a live experience i think this, there might be some um maybe there is some change in the globalization but i still believe that um there might be some shifting in the local production there might be more about sustainability in most of the products so that you might not be just keep buying i think that would all affect shipping whether the volume will grow or not that's another matter but as i mentioned it's because capital did not come to the industry for quite some time and did not, they did not make money. So that naturally, uh, lots of weakest companies have fallen off. Now it's a good time, the right amount of shipping company, right amount of capital is going into this specialized industry. So I think so long there's global trade, there will be shipping. So it's just in what form of shipping. And if you're looking at the change in the technology in the energy sector, so there might not be tankers in 10 or 20 years time but you might have other type of, of, of energy coming up and container container com, uh, container shipping company for, for white goods. There might be some change of instead of having long haul, maybe there is some local production starting to have. And look, car carrier business is no longer an auto industry anymore. It's pretty much like a computer on the wheel or you need to have a battery. So you don't really need to ship the whole car. You might have assembly plot in the country, or you need to ship your battery. So these are all uh, uh, unimaginable right now, will be happening in the future. So I think shipping will be dedicated that into moving goods around. So that what I see that shipping will still be continue to be important, but that is in the revolution alongside with all the other industries. Yeah. Um, as we always say, that shipping has its own cycle, and we have seen how this cycle has been affected by these new revolutions and situations. So, um, Madeline, 
how do you think that the Chinese financial institution's participation will has affected and will affect this cycle? Um, I think that they will probably change the nature of ship finance in the sense that there will be less straight bank funding. Um, you can already see there's less um, straight financial bank bilaterals or syndicated transactions. There's a 12.8% apparently rise in Chinese leasing. Um, you also see that there are some bonds issued in relation to raising funds for these ship finance deals. There's also private equity funds being involved. Um, there's also project finance and there's also joint ventures um, between the, the ship, shipping um, lessors. So I think in terms of Chinese le leasing, because they are more active, they actually inspire and encourage the different forms of funding because I've seen that the Chinese lessors themselves have um, initiated the bonds. They themselves have been involved with PE funds and joint ventures with each other. And they've also done project finance transactions, um, you know, which uh, some of the traditional banks don't do. So um, it, it, by their very presence and by their activity, they are sustaining the ship funding um, in the market and they are working with the different players and bringing them in. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Serena, do you have anything to let us know about this topic? Uh, yes, um, I think, um, as we know, Chinese financial institution participated in shipping finance mainly after the financial crisis and became more and more active in recent years. Uh, we can see them has accounted for some portion from the shipping lenders ranking list. They are strong supporters for, uh, for the global ship owners during the most difficult period. Uh, as for COVID-19, uh, Chinese financial institutions not only uh, face to the same issues as all international banks, but also face to specific difficulties caused by the US-China political tension. Uh, but I can see all of the commitments that have been delivered by Chinese uh, financial inst institutions successfully till now. I want to highlight China Exim Bank had the most stable funding cost during US dollar liquidity crisis early this year. So I believe Chinese financial institutions have been and will continue to be the main stays in any revolution. Thanks for all your sharing today. And to wrap up this session, um, can I invite each of you to give us one or two key words for the future in terms of cooperation between the international banks and Chinese financial institutions? Uh, James, can we start from you? Wow. Words, only a few words, right? <laughs> the I think more the better. The more the better mm -hmm. in terms of the co co cooperation, collaboration. I think probably in the past there'll be Western Bank, we're talking about more familiar with the shipping, but we also have emerging shipping clients, emerging shipping financing providers. I think it's how we can emerge, merge them together so that for the better risk and diversification of risk management, and also to allow us to not to just only put all the capital in one client and allow each of us to really see risk very differently, to avoid a situation like any crisis that the supply of the tonnage is more than the demand because it's naturally there will be a, a a a a lack between the supply and demand so to avoid uh less damage and to make this shipping industry more sustainable and profitable so i do see that financial providers should work with each other more and on a consensus rather than just only chasing deals for the sake of a deal, but instead as a looking at as the as the need for this industry so that will be all sustainable. I think this is a fantastic time for us to really start looking at this. So that will be my, my words. More the better. Thank you, Natalie. Um, 
elaboration I'll talk about. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, James. Um, Madeline, what would be your words? Um, I think there will be more collaboration. Uh, I can see it already because we've been involved in a few debt restructurings and I've seen that the Chinese uh, institutions and lessors have got a very good understanding of what is required and they've also got a good understanding that it is sometimes uh, beneficial to support the company um, in times of trouble so that they can reap better and stronger um, profits and uh, uh, dividends uh, subsequently. So I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of mutual um, benefit in in for that for them to carry on collaborating because they can learn from each other and they learn different things from each other. Yeah. So collaboration. Um, Serena, what would be your key word? And I think I want to use possibility. Um, possibility not only become belongs to the US, it is also in our shipping world. Although we have to experience many disappointed moments, um, but we keep trying to make the possibilities come true. Thank you. The um, Maureen? Let's know your word. Um, I think my keywords are yeah, keep talking, keep sharing, keep communication, and most importantly, stay safe and healthy, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. And that's the end of this uh, panel discussion. So if you have any questions, you can raise it here, or I can. I think you can submit to the chat box. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much, Simone and uh, the panel. Um, uh, Jonathan uh, Silver, if you also want to uh, join in again, for some questions. We have a few questions uh, that have been submitted from our audience. Um, <clears throat> so kind of two related questions on the Poseidon principles. I'm going to direct them to James. Uh, one question is, have you seen deals fall apart because the parties involved had different views on environmental issues or the Poseidon principles? And then another follow-up question to that is, when you're building a club deal or syndicated deal, do you stress compliance with the Poseidon principles when you send out the invite to participation to other banks? Uh, in fact, we have been working with our panel council, like Madeline and uh, uh, Watson Valley, like that, to already build in um, the language in our loan documentations. I think most of the signatories will be uh, working with that already and most of our clients in fact would strictly follow those guidance in fact for Poseidon principle no additional data needed to be sent out to the lenders in fact those data is already submitted to the classification to the IMO so in this case yes for us because we will be looking at portfolio and then if we see that we are falling short or because of those clients' compliance or so, we will be able to mobilize, make a conscious decision to mobilize our capital into a more green project. We also don't look at old vessels now, if that is basically understanding their efficiency might not be high. And no, I haven't seen any deal that has fallen apart because on day one, we already very clear and also knowing which banking partners that we could work with. Um, but having said that, there are not many projects really in the market right now. I think a lot of ship owners are looking for opportunity to invest into the right ships. And 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 so so far so the no I haven't seen any 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 transaction that is fallen through because of the ESG. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So um, another question here, uh, the lack of clarity on new fuel and propulsion has, called, has caused a pause in global shipbuilding. How might that affect the activities of Chinese leasing companies? And might it mean there will be more banking com competition for the good new building deals? Maureen? Mm. Um, yes. The, the technology issue, um, I think the, the issue has been already um, exist, has already existed last year, but then uh, COVID-19 has amplified um, the whole issue. Um, so 
I, the, the first question is whether Chinese leasing companies will, sorry, I, I, I didn't get the first question. Um, how, how will the lack of, um, or, or the, the reduction in shipbuilding uh, activity affect Chinese leasing companies? Uh, I don't think it will have a huge impact. It's not that Chinese leasing companies are only doing uh, new building vessels. Um, so I don't see major impact. They can, they can always finance some um, existing tonnage. Um, but of course, um, on the other hand, I think um, the reason why the whole uh, shipping market is, is not doing so bad this year, uh, um, although um, there's a COVID-19, is that the, the supply book, the order book, is not as high as the, um, when it was in the um, global financial crisis. But I think um, over the time, the issue will be sorted out. Um, the, the market will, have, will, will form some common practice and the market consensus. Um, it's an ever-changing uh, industry. Shipping has been, um, this industry has been um, developing for the past a few hundred years. Uh, I think, well, if you look at a few hundred years, this is just a very short period of time in, in terms of the long history. So over the time, all the issues will be, will be solved um, and everyone will find um, the solution that fit them well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. A question uh, that came in for Serena. Now that you're able to approach many finance providers, do you notice that there is a lot of differentiation in terms offered between the various finance providers and lease houses? Uh, uh, I think the answer is yes. But uh, in general, I think either financial, uh, financial, financial leasing companies and uh, uh, shipping banks, they, in, in, they, they they are in principle is the same uh, from the credit perspective. Uh, so although there may be some uh, different leverage, different uh, securities or different uh, pricing or different structure, uh, I think the, the good credit uh, is preferred by all of the financial institutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, I'm not sure who to direct this question to. Maybe, maybe Madeline. Uh, the question is on the topic of growing of the growing trend of Chinese leasing houses hedging their risk against distressed shipping assets. Would you mm -hmm. agree that it would be beneficial to engage third party ship managers as opposed to an in-house technical operations team for a leaner structure? Yes. Um, I think there is benefit in that, but I largely what happens is a lot of the lessees would prefer to retain their own managers if you're doing a sale and leaseback structure. Um, I, and I assume you're talking about under a sale and leaseback transaction as opposed to if they took back a distressed asset or are you talking about post acquisition of a distressed asset? If it's post acquisition of a distressed asset, then obviously it would be better to um, involve an independent professional ship finance uh, ship manager to run run the vessels and operate and manage it that that's certain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you um and perhaps a question uh for simone and vincent you know the last 10 years have been characterized by the by the withdrawal of the western banks and the kind of the rise of chinese leasing in ship financing uh, however, uh, Chinese leasing companies haven't seemed to grow their presence in foreign markets. You know, I mean, apart from a few, um, they, they, they generally they don't have offices in, in, in European countries or in America or, or in other parts of the world. Do you think that, especially during this time um, with COVID-19 restrictions, um, making it difficult for people to travel and do due diligence, that, that it's now the time for Chinese lessors to establish a physical presence in other markets? Uh, I would say that there is a tendency that uh, the Chinese leasing companies are doing business with European ship owners. Um, we have seen this tendency has increasingly emerged in the past two to three years, although they not yet have a physical presence there. And even in this year, with the difficulty of COVID-19, there are still some uh, transactions 
which has been completed between the Chinese lessors and Western uh, charterers. So I don't think that without the lack of the uh, physical presence will um, will make it impossible. But um, maybe we think that it will make grow from time to time uh, when that the uh, Chinese lessors has already built up enough cases and they find it is necessary to have a, a a physical presence there, and then they will think that they can, they have enough business to support a physical presence in European. So I think there is a tendency in this, in terms of the uh, Chinese leasing companies in European. Is it any other view? Yes, I, I totally agree with Simon. I can add from my perspective that uh, probably from five or six years ago, uh, leasing companies engaged us as lawyers to travel around with them. Uh, in Europe to uh, to to conclude deals with European ship owners. So I think that it is it, very open to to do a deal internationally. It, it is the case. And secondly, what I want to add is that uh, uh, because Chinese Chinese ship is now the, the largest ship in, in the world. So uh, I mean, for the from commercial perspective, if the uh, the owners want to finance vessels and vessels happen to build in China, it's just a you know combined trip to looking for financer uh, in China uh, and also the vessel is built in China. So, uh, so the chance that it's easier to 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 conclude deal uh, for for the for them to travel to China instead of the other way around. Yeah, uh, and also because of this COVID nineteen situation, people find that they can do the business without traveling. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would, sorry, if I can jump in, I would agree with that entirely. I think the one thing that COVID has taught us is that working from home does work um, and it is possible yeah. to do deals um, if you have to. Uh, and so uh, as, uh, and you do find a lot of the Chinese lessors do have rep office in, um, in Greece and in Paris, and they are largely for for you know um, PR and BD, and that's what's important. Someone on the ground to facilitate relationships, but when it comes to the nuts and bolts, invariably they'd want to go back to head office to make the financial decisions. So I'm not sure it's necessary to have. A branch office per se, because um, the way that IT and communication works today, it, it does enable everybody to do things virtually. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I, sorry. I, I also want to 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 add some comments. I think although we can work. We can still work under this uh, COVID-19 situation, but uh, I I believe it's a temporary uh, situation. We cannot uh, live like this for I think more than two years. So business is the same, uh, but although uh, we will be affected by many and unpredicted uh, um, uh, situations, but uh, I think. Uh, the broker houses like Transport Capital will be a good partner for all of the uh, potential deals uh, globally. Thank you. Uh, just to give a chance uh, to Jonathan to see if he's got any comments. I know that he's been listening to the to the panel discussion. Jonathan, do you have anything to say? Uh, I haven't really got anything to add, Andrew. No. Or all right, thanks. And uh, just uh, you know, one one final question to to wrap up. Um, so the question is, uh, you know, we, the the order book is 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 really looking low at the moment, and um, and uh, and the increase in cargoes and tonnage demographics uh, have been reduced this year. So. Just a, a, a quick one from each of you. Are are you bullish uh, for next year and for the and for the and for the next few years? Uh, do you are, are you bullish on the markets? Maybe go start first. with. Uh, yeah, you go first, James. Well, I'm never worried about that because it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but I think employment of all, I think it's very good discipline for the shipping company. I think over the last 20 years, this is the very first time this industry is not being classified. In the last 20 years, all these financial crisis, uh, financial tsunamis, supply and demand, Asian financial crisis, the one that who who got got 
bunch with the banks and also shipping company. That's why you see a lot of consolidation. Not having a lot of asset order, I think it's a good thing for shipping company to recuperate their, their balance sheets so that to prepare for the future for investing in new ships. So I think it is a good time for them to continue to deleverage. And I think this is really good time in a long run for many shipping banks in for ourselves. And yes, they might not be used in a case, but I believe that clients will make sensible investment at a time is right. I think, in fact, we should not really fixate it and concentrate on how many ships are there because we, if we continue to look at it like this, it becomes asset financing. That means we will attract speculators, we will attract investors to invest in these ships, not using it as an operating asset, but investment asset. So that would create a situation that oversupply again, and ultimately who's gonna get hurt will be shipping company and the lenders. So I'm not too worried about that. I think it's a good, good discipline and good timing, prepare that 10 years ago when there was financial crisis. Anyone else have anything to add on that? Uh, I, I, I'm not, oh. I, I completely agree with uh, James. I think uh, the important thing here is that uh, if people uh, who are putting money into the industry treat uh, shipping assets as investment assets, uh, that's kind of dangerous. So I think it must be based upon underlying business. And this COVID-19 and, and the current environmental situation actually providing a uh, it's, in a way, it's a limit, but on the other hand, it's actually, it's, it's actually unlawfully healthy for the industry. So I, I think it's uh, on the long run, it's okay, and uh, on the short term, I think uh, people will be more careful and more prudent, and also it depends upon the size of, and also type of ships as well. People will be very careful in terms of making money, putting money into the, into the, into the industry. Mm -hmm. I, I Thank you. Think it also, yeah, it also depends on the type of vessels you're talking about because the different sectors are quite different and the impact will be very different. So you have to look at, I don't think you can lump it all together though. Agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, thank you, Vincent and Simone, Maureen, Serena and James uh, for your insights. Uh, today. That's the end of uh, the session. Uh, for those of you listening in, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website later today or tomorrow. We will also be sending up a follow-up follow email tomorrow uh, with some contact details. So if your question wasn't answered in today's session, you can uh, follow up with our speakers from tomorrow. Uh, our next session, session three and the final session of our virtual Marine Money China conference is up next at 2 p.m or sorry, at 4 p.m. Uh, China time. So please be sure to register and join us for that. Infor more information on the conference and, and the sessions can be found on our website, marinemoney.com. Thank you once again, all of you, uh, for tuning in. This is your host, Andrew Oates from Marine Money, signing out. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.